very grateful for this opportunity we have this morning to be together. Thankful for all those that are assembled, especially our visitors with us. We have a good crowd assembled and, and very grateful that uh, my mom and dad are able to be with us this morning. We welcome you and uh, realize that the jig is up. Um, I, I can only uh, uh, <laughs> hope that uh, they don't uh, tell too much. Uh, so uh, so don't don't ask anything. If, they're, if they want to tell you something, then, then that's fine. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, they're they're uh, wonderful and grateful that they've come to support uh, us here this day and, and to be with us. We're we're very thankful for that. Uh, we want to continue our series of the the book of Colossians. So if you would turn in your uh, New Testaments to that book, Colossians chapter one. And we spent a little bit of time last Sunday doing some introductory remarks concerning the, the background of the book. And of course, we realized that uh, what really has been going on is um, some great work was being done in this area. There was a, a man by the name of Epaphras who had been converted by the Apostle Paul. And so he came and he was so excited by what he had learned that he, he just had to share the news with uh, the city where he was residing, which was Colossae. So he kept telling other people about the gospel, about Jesus Christ, and the, uh, the faith that, that he uh, allows us to be saved by, and, and others believed it and were saved. And a church started there, and it continued to grow and, and, and was prosperous. Then all of a sudden there was some other uh, people who started showing up, maybe traveling through or, or nearby, uh, who heavily were influenced by the Jewish system of worship. Uh, there was a lot of confusion going on in those days because obviously God primarily was dealing with the nation of Israel through the law of Moses uh, to reveal his, his will. Of course, all of that was temporary. and We've been talking about that uh, beginning our lesson last Sunday morning, that it was temporary until the fulfillment of all the promises made originally to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And once the fulfillment came, which was through Jesus, he was from their lineage, uh, then there was going to be no need for the law of Moses. There was going to be no need for uh, that system of worship, even of the Ten Commandments, which perhaps maybe causes a little bit of confusion even today. But it caused a great deal of confusion with the church at Colossae. And so that's why we have this letter. Is uh, Paphras went to Paul and he said, what do you make of all this? A lot of people telling us uh, that we have to live by the, the commandments that, that Moses had and and uh, the, the, these things are, are very important to us, but, but we don't remember Epaphras uh, telling us anything. Or Epaphras, I, I don't remember Paul telling me any of these things. I didn't learn this about the gospel. And so that's what the letter is really all about, clarifying some of these things. So we want to have a, kind of a part two this morning. We talked about last Sunday morning uh, of noting the difference between the first, which is the old covenant, and the second, which is the new covenant. Uh, that we might uh, see these differences uh, given through Scripture and might learn what the Colossians were learning um, as they studied along from the Apostle Paul. But I just want to go back to uh, that book, Colossians chapter 1, and I want to focus on one particular phrase. We'll look at both this morning and this evening. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. And those two phrases, we're going to get more into that next Sunday. Note those phrases, the faith that they had and the love that they consequently had for all saints. This is rooted in what? In the gospel they heard about Jesus Christ. It affected them this way. They are now living by faith, and this faith is causing them to have a deep, abiding love that affects everybody in the congregation and those that they, know, that they are interacting with. He says, I've heard of your faith in Christ and the love which you have for all the saints because... Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you. In other words, he says, I realize this faith you have in Jesus, rooted in Him, it's now affected uh, how you interact with everybody 
in the congregation, everybody you meet in your life, their life is now defined by two things. Well, really, essentially rooted in, in, in three, mainly faith is the foundation, but faith, hope, and love. These are the key marks of anyone who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the faith that they have brings to them this hope. That, that, this, it, it defines everything about their life. In other words, it almost seems that they, they seem to have an invincible outlook everywhere they go. They almost have this sense that where other people are, are, are feeling afraid or, or, or feeling burdened or, or feeling frustrated or feeling angry. They have this countenance about them that suggests that they know everything's going to be alright. They feel this inner peace that everything seems to be going to work out okay in the end. Because all of this is focused on something that where they're headed that's not here. It's headed in something that can't be tangible, can't be attained in this present life. And it's all because of Christ Jesus, because of the res resurrection and the evidence of that, that here's one who overcame death, who's now living in heaven, who's providing faith, hope, and love for those who follow Him, who want to live through this life, truly living the abundant life, which is looking for the life that is yet to come, and then consequently living in this life, simply wanting to serve, simply wanting to help, simply wanting to be a blessing to others around them because they realize that that's the gift Jesus has given to us. When we realize we no longer have to fear much in this life, we can have that kind of an outlook. And so Paul is very concerned. He wants to make sure that they keep that outlook. And he realizes what's at stake is if you, if you start changing some of the teachings that are they're allowing you to live this way, it's going to rob you of this. You won't be able to live this way anymore. It's going to affect this. And so that's what we want to talk about when we continue our discussion of the old law. It's temporary place, and it was, as we read in the book of Colossians, it was nailed to the cross. As we talked about, sometimes that can be kind of alarming. A lot of people can even wonder, you mean we, we don't go by the Ten Commandments anymore? Thou shalt not uh, murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not... Uh, commit adultery, the, those Ten Commandments? Yes. Do so you mean we don't have any moral obligation? Yes, we have moral obligation. So we'll, we'll explain how, how does that work. So we want to kind of get a little bit more specific into that in, in our discussion. And then in, in preparing for this, I couldn't help but think there was a, there's a comedy uh, uh, piece. Uh, the late George Carlin actually brought this up in uh, one of his, his comedy specials. He he talked about the, the Ten Commandments and realized this was something that he had grown up with, was very familiar with. And it's interesting, he, he takes aim at it. He says, well, I always kind of wondered, well, why, why are there ten? And of course, his aim, he, he's, he's uh, being a little sarcastic about this and, and he's kind of a little uh, skeptical about it all. But, but he's trying to make a point and saying, uh, why, why did there have to be ten to begin with? And of course, his assumption is that it was intended for us to live by these principles today. And he, as he kind of make, takes aim at these things, he says, well, I, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you that if we really use just kind of a, a level of common sense and, and, and what is in human decency, I'm going to show you we really don't only need ten, we really only need two. And when he goes to this piece, he says, and the two you really only need is, yes, you ought to be faithful to your spouse. You ought to be honest. And shouldn't try to kill anybody. I think if we all live by these two things, everything is going to be okay. We don't need Ten Commandments. When I, when I uh, heard that piece, I, 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 was, I was laughing uh, on the inside as well with him because I realized the irony of this is he doesn't realize how close he is to what God teaches on this. He, in that piece where he says there really only needs to be a couple of general rules of morality, that actually was what God taught before or the Ten Commandments ever came. And we're going to talk about that, but there's a passage in Psalm 147, uh, Psalm 147, verses 19 through 20, that re reminds us, again, the Ten Commandments were not a universal law. It was not something that every single human being is, regard is responsible to know and, and abide by. In fact, it was only for one nation. It was only given to the nation, uh, traced back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And remember, it says it was added years later to aid them to get to the fulfillment of promises made to him. 
Notice that passage of Psalm 147, verse 19. It says, He declares His words to Jacob, His statutes and His ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for His ordinances, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. And so, he, he, in the sense, He's right. That no, 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 no universal law of Ten Commandments ever really was meant uh, to be uh, given to every nation. We actually can trace back the implicit statements of God really are boiled down to what George Carlin kind of he thought you could do is a few of them. Uh, the implicit statements are summed up in this. Honor God. Be faithful in marriage. Don't murder. At least from the beginning of time. Uh, the first thing given to Adam and Eve, of course, was the idea that they were to cleave to one another. They were to be faithful in their marriage. They are also to honor God. They were to honor His commandments. The first commandment, of course, don't eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Uh, of course, they disobeyed that command and found out where the dishonoring God gets you. And so after that, after they left the garden, of course, we find that their children, Cain and Abel, they are seeking to please, to honor God. They were required to give sacrifices. So we realize that that was something that was implicitly declared, that they should honor God, and that they should be faithful in their marriages. And as we find that when Cain killed Abel, we realize, of course, God held them accountable for that. You're not supposed to kill anybody. Well, guess what we find out? We find out that years later, as the nation uh, became very, very wicked and God was going to try to uh, start everything over again through Noah and his family, after Noah gets off the ark, you know what I find interesting what God says to him? Simply in a nutshell, the simple general commands that uh, the comedian George Carlin kind of thought, well, wouldn't it be easier if we just kind of summed it up this way? Actually, God did. God did. Uh, turn over to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. And note verse 3. This is after the flood waters have receded, and the only living beings on the earth are Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And God says this to them. In verse 3, he says, Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man... As for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Notice again, he simply emphasizes two original commands. Be faithful to your, your, your spouse, your, your responsibilities there. Be fruitful and multiply in your marriage. And don't kill anybody. Don't eat, don't eat blood uh, in, in, in the animal. Honor, honor life. Honor that the life is in the blood. Now, of course, from these these implicit statements, a whole host of morality is learned from them. Of course, we realize God undoubtedly was also dealing with them uh, as He revealed in, in, in various ways. As we find when we get to the, the uh, family of Abraham, uh, even though this is the only thing that's implicitly stated from God at this point, what do we later find out? Not just being faithful in your marriage or not just killing anybody, but even lying. We recognize that God had taught people that lying was not okay. When we realize that Abraham, he gets into Egypt with his wife, and he's terrified because his wife is so beautiful. He's so scared that they're going to kill him because of his wife. So he says, I'm going to tell a little lie. I'm going to say that uh, she's just my sister. And so again, so some people show some interest in her, and they're about to, to take her for their own. All of a sudden it's revealed that, wait a minute, uh, she's not available. Uh, she belongs to somebody else. And they got very upset about it. And they upset very much and said, Why did you lie to us? In other words, from these general principles, yes, we can understand that God is revealing, yes, be honest, be faithful, be loyal, don't steal, don't lie, don't take what doesn't belong to you. Honor uh, your, your God, honor, honor the Creator and, and all the things uh, of other life that He's given to us. And what we find actually later on is that this is how God dealt with all of mankind, uh, in Romans chapter 2, Paul re reminds his audience and says that God wasn't just dealing with the Jews. In fact, what he was dealing with the Jews was the Ten Commandments. It was an amplified version, a more detailed, more strict 
set of regulations designed to be talked about before to show and reveal that there was always going to be a great need for us to cling to God, resolve our problem with sin. But the outside of the nation of Israel, we find as everybody else was able to implicitly understand through their conscience, through generalized uh, understanding what, what God has revealed essentially to mankind, we simply can understand what is right and what is wrong. Turn to Romans chapter 2, which we can understand these things without Ten Commandments. But even going back to what God had already originated in Noah and his family and those things that have been passed down to other generations, we certainly know the difference between right and wrong. And our conscience bears witness and convicts us, makes us feel guilty when we do not abide by it. Romans chapter 2, notice verse uh, 14. It says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, and that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So in other words, everybody essentially always has, whether you have the Ten Commandments or not, that's his point, is that even nations throughout, man, throughout history who did not have a system of ten specific commandments, we all proverbially have that good angel and bad angel whispering to us, telling us what we inherently know is right and to do what we inherently know is wrong. And that's his point. He says that stemming from the general implicit statements that God had given, honoring your, your marriage vows, don't kill anybody, honor life, uh, honor God, be honest, uh, be, be uh, ethical. Yes, absolutely. And of course, a lot of people take aim at the Ten Commandments saying that why, why would God expect uh, uh, us to, to narrow it down that way? No, it's just that, that one nation as He dealt with them as he was teaching and trying to explain and show something that would be uh, uh, kind of ele elevated to a certain point that would be easy to see. But as we see, we're going to see, in fact, one of the greatest, one of the greatest examples of a, of a moral citizen, so to speak, who was not going by the Ten Commandments, who was just going by God's general principles and laws, uh, was a man by the name of Cornelius. And we read him, and we read how he had come to be a very upstanding individual without a series of commandments, but actually he was simply going by a, 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 a moral ethical uh, law. Of course, he, he wanted to uh, be a um, servant of God. He honored the Jews. When we look at Acts chapter 10, I know what it says about this individual. It's kind of, I believe, a kind of an example of kind of the, the best, if you will, of individuals who don't need or, or have not been taught Ten Commandments. Of what is possible. Here's an individual in Acts chapter 10, verse 1, who was of the Gentiles, those outside the uh, nation and bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It says here, it says, There was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, devout man, and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Just an overwhelmed, just good guy. Ethical guy. Moral guy. In fact, Peter uh, goes back and reminds uh, him, uh, understanding, recognizing that, that undoubtedly God looks at everybody like Cornelius, who didn't go by Ten Commandments, but simply went by the general principles of what we all, through our conscience, bears witness, that we understand the difference between right and wrong, and there's ability for us to go by that. Turn to Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Peter reminds... Um, uh, Cornelius, that he's beginning to recognize this. Because, of course, you know, the, the problem with the Jews, they had a, a little bit of pride. They thought uh, that they were the only ones uh, who could do what was right. And that's the point of Romans saying, I uh, know. <laughs> In fact, uh, you realize there's a whole generation of people that, even though they didn't even have the law, that could instinctively, by just simply knowing what's right and wrong, uh, do that. Well, here's Cornelius. And that's what it says in verse 34 of Acts chapter 10. It says, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him, and note, does what is right. Does what is right. 
And that's the point Paul makes. I think he's, everybody pretty much knows <laughs> what is right. You don't need Ten Commandments. You know, that was never the point. That was never the design to have a universal Ten Commandments for all of God's uh, creation. We pretty much understand through the implicit direction of yes, understand that we honor life. We honor our spouses. We honor the, the instruction of God to, to be fruitful and multiply and to be ethically honest and upright. The problem was that one came upon this earth who was able to live absolutely perfect. And that was the message that came to this upright, upstanding individual who did what was right. It was probably one of the greatest examples of someone outside of the Jewish nation who did what was right, who honored his conscience, who had a sensitive conscience, who wanted to always do the right thing, yet still needed the gospel. And I want to just go through that here and we'll just read that and why, why that had, had to be and what, what he was learning from this. But Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. This, again, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. Not to all the people but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. That's where we want to focus our point here. This next point is that God appointed Jesus to be the judge of the living and the dead, in other words, of every nation, not just of the nation of Israel who had the Ten Commandments, but all of those who have the general principles and the implicit statements of knowing what is right and what is wrong. Unfortunately, there did come one who lived absolutely perfectly in the flesh and demonstrated now he is appointed to be a judge of all the rest of us. We'll get to the whether this actually leads to the good news that the gospel brings to us. But he was absolutely perfect in every single way. His conscience bearing with him, and he even stating on many occasions that they would be hard pressed for anybody to charge him accurately with committing a sin. Remember in John chapter 8, turn to John chapter 8, when he was having a discussion with a lot of his, his enemies and his agitators who were trying so hard to bring something up that they could uh, let stick or, or, or show that he was either a hypocrite or, or he had no authority or, or just committed sin in, in general. And he flat out comes right out and says, I'm open and if anyone can bring an accusation against me, go ahead and bring it. I, I ask you, who, who here charges me with sin? John chapter 8 beginning in verse 39. It says, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but He sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father 
of lies, but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Verse 46, which one of you convicts me of sin? Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God for this reason. You do not hear them because you are not of God. And all throughout the scriptures it is confirmed again that yes, there was no way anyone could lay a single charge of sin against Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And when he demonstrated, as he was preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, as he was explaining uh, just how, how we all go through this life and, and, and the weaknesses and the struggles and the temptations we all face, whether we're uh, the, the, the Jew or the Gentile alike, and that's the message of the Gospel, appeals to all of humanity. That These Ten Commandments are simply dealing with helping the nation of Israel fulfill certain things so that the promises could be filled, that the Messiah could come and truly be a help to mankind's problem with sin. But in all of this, it is indicated that Jesus was the only true human being. And yes, He was every bit human as we are, yet He was divine. That's one of the points that the book of Colossians makes, is that He had all the fullness of deity dwelling in Him. Indicating that He was absolutely perfect in every way. When He preaches in the Sermon on the Mount, He indicates that He was so perfect and that not only was He able to obey every ten commandment, of the law of, of Israel, but he went, went beyond it. Not only did Jesus never murder, Jesus never hated anybody. Jesus showed constant love and compassion for even his most bitter enemies. Jesus was willing to offer extensions of forgiveness and, and compassion towards those who were spitting at him, who, were, who hated him without cause. And then challenges those who are listening. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there in that? But if you love those who hate you, then you can be perfect like your Father in heaven. And Jesus, the full depiction of that which is capable of humanity, did all this. And He is going to constantly be that judge, that standard of what is truly acceptable to mankind. The problem is that we fall so short of it. Even those who outside that Ten Commandments, who just in a general sense, allowing our conscience to dictate, going by the general principles of what we know is right or wrong, are unable to do it perfectly. We have problems. The problem is that when Jesus tried to show that to the Jews, they didn't want to know their problems. They didn't want to know their weaknesses. They didn't want anybody showing them what they were short of. That was their job to show everybody else where their problems were. And so when Jesus starts showing them where their shortcomings are, and then agitated them. But Jesus simply saying, if, if I'm out of line here, show me my sin. You show me my sin. Show me one example where I've fallen short in any way. And again, rather than accept this as the truth, it just agitated them even more. But this was the message given to Cornelius, one who was living by the general principles of what is right and wrong, recognizing that there was one who lived perfectly, who came and is going to ultimately be the standard, going to be the judge of all of mankind. In fact, this is what Paul says in his gospel in Acts chapter 10. Turn over to Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. In Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 34, it says, oh, or, or excuse me, uh, Acts, uh, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Acts chapter 17, verse 30, as Paul was preaching the gospel, he says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. The good news is that as Jesus was the fulfillment of the original promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as He is then appointed to be the sole judge of all those who fail to live 100% all the time, letting our conjure bear witness that we're doing what is right, He truly fulfilled the promises and that He demonstrates that there is a way that we can be saved 
without 100% all the time living by the standard of laws against us. God nailed those things on the cross, taken it out of the way, and is going to allow a system through which you and I can be justified through Christ and His sacrifice. That rather be judged by His life, we through His life can be saved. Because this is where the, the, the letter of the Colossians is going to move on that point because later going to, there's going to be a great statement we're going to focus on as we go through the letter of the Colossians. It's going to say, Christ in us is our hope of glory. The hope that we have is that one who is perfect in every sense of the way, in ways beyond our own understanding, is able to impart grace to us through a system of faith, not a system of laws of do's and don'ts. But through our faith, we can truly be saved and we can live through Him and then be taught by Him to truly please God in every way as we follow His leadership, we follow His teaching to crucify our love for this world and we become more and more like the Savior. But ultimately, I just want to go to the book of Romans and we're going to close our lesson. I want to look at Romans chapter 4 and show a beautiful way how, how even the original way that God dealt with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob before the Ten Commandments came was actually foreshadowing how God would deal with you and I. And the point that Paul is going to make here in Romans chapter 4 is isn't it interesting that here Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob found a way to please God even before the Ten Commandments came, and outside of a system of, 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 of obeying a system of commandments, but rather obeying a direction of God that allowed them to be justified by their belief and their faith. I just want to read this together. Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. And verse 16 says, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead, and it calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope, he believes that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which he had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness." Now not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited. Notice all of this, that they were being justified before the law, and not by a system of law, but by a system of their trust and faith in God. All of this predicted that this is how you and I, through the gospel of Christ, one who lived that perfect life, who died as, uh, in a position to judge us, does not want to judge us. He wants to impart us the life and the grace and the forgiveness and the release of that through the gospel, through obedience of baptism that gives us access to His perfect record. Notice what it says here in verse 24, the end of verse 24, As those who believe in Him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. What does Paul say in chapter 5, verse 1 then? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That was the gospel that was preached to that Gentile Cornelius. So yes, up to this point, you've been living a pretty good moral life. Your conscience bearing witness to you that you know the general principles of what's right and wrong, but you know there was one who lived a perfect life. And God is not going to hold him as the standard. And since that unfortunately puts us at a great disadvantage, thankfully it was not to hurt us. It was to help us. Because he does not then hold the Ten Commandments over us. In fact, he does not even hold a system of, uh, 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 of law over us. It is, it is a law of, of liberty. It is a law of love. It is a law of, of faith that yes has morality working in it. It is a, a law that, that, that teaches us to put to death our love for our selfish desires that allows us to live yes, morally upright. The beauty of this is that ultimately it is by faith that we are saved. 
the system of grace. And all of this was amazingly predicted through the way God dealt with the fathers even before the law was instilled. So I just want to kind of bring that, we're going to have one final lesson next Sunday morning to kind of wrap this all together in this issue, the old law and the new law. But I find it so amazing that all of this was working in our favor to show us that when Christ could be the fulfillment of all the promises, remember the promise made to Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, we're, we're part of all the nations. And how we are blessed that we no longer have to fear any sense of judgment. That there's no need to, set, to, to fear judgment. If our life has been given to Christ, if we've crucified the flesh, been buried in water and baptism for forgiveness of our sins and are now walking by faith, that's the beauty of the gospel. And we are going to continue to have another other lesson that will kind of show again that there is the, a continual uh, way that we walk morally that we have uh, examples of Christ that shows we're going to kind of bring this all together. But ultimately, we need to have that confidence that we are saved by our, our faith through obedience to Him in this manner. So if anyone has never obeyed the gospel, we want to encourage you that you would alleviate yourself from any worry, from any sense of judgment, recognizing that Christ came to free us from that. And you can have access to that if you come. Recognize that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and are willing to be baptized for forgiveness. We will help and assist you and do that. Won't you come to the front, and we will assist and help you in your baptism while we stand and sing the psalm of encouragement together.